there we are. It's a first date. First dates are, are amazing. They're exciting. We're, I'm driving down the road, and, and we're, we're driving to this restaurant to, to go get dinner, and then we're going to go to a movie. And, and as we're, we're driving, I, I look over, and, and that was a really great first dater. Um, second dates, maybe not so much, but first dates, I was killed it. Uh, but So we're driving, and I'm asking all the right questions. You know, tell me about your family. What do you like to do for fun? Tell me about the sport you do. Um, all, tell me about your friends. All these different things. Meanwhile, at each one of these questions I posed, I, I met with, yeah, uh-huh, mm-hmm, yeah, mm, uh, I don't know. You guys, you guys ever met somebody like that that's like stuck on, stuck on their phone, like, like you can't get their attention, they're, they're just, does that, does that drive anybody else nuts, anybody, not just me, a couple of you guys? Yeah, so that, that was, it was the worst first day ever. I'm asking all the right, getting to know you questions, trying, trying to make her feel important and valued. And the return conversation I'm getting is just glances at a phone. Oh, I forgot this one. It's just <laughs> not, not my joke, whatever text joke that this was. And, and I'm like, what is going on here? This is the most bizarre first date I have ever been on. It, it was, it was the, the weirdest thing. And, and probably because of it is probably the reason why we only dated for like four months. You're like, what? You still date? Yeah, we still dated a little bit longer than that. It didn't get much better for, from there. And it was, uh, the, the challenge was, is anytime we were together, the conversation just, it wasn't there. There was, there was no chemistry. There was, there was no connection. There was, there was no connectivity or conversation. And, and, and so it obviously didn't work. And, uh, and the reason why was because honestly, anytime that we talked, I never actually felt heard or, or listened to or, or cared for or, or valued. You see, the thing is, is we can all slip into that mode from, from time to time. All right. Not, not just, not just Stephanie S, but, but we all do that from, from time to time where, where we can get distracted. We can get caught up in whatever we're doing. And when we do that, we can make somebody feel unvaluable. Right. And, uh, and see, the thing is, is, when we make it a habit to, to not listen to others, maybe because we're talking about ourselves all the time or we're distracted, um, we, uh, other people begin to make it a habit to not listen to us either. And, and so as we've been going through this series called Pass It On, we've been talking about what it means for us as followers of Jesus to, to pass on the good news that, that Jesus loves us, that he died for us so that he can save us, so we can have a relationship with him. It's life-changing, eternity-changing information but people are only willing to receive it if we, they feel like we're willing to listen and receive them, right? And, and so, so that's why this is so important. You see, um, this relationship does end with, with Stephanie S. Uh, uh, we developed what, what I would call the cycle of huh, which is I would ask a question and she'd go, huh? <laughs> and uh, and that, that was what our relationship was like, you see? And that's not good. That's not a good trait if you want to have friends. It's not a good trait. Um, if if you, you have an important message that you want to share uh, or that you want people to hear. And that's what I found with, with Stephanie. And so, um, see, the thing is, we can come up with all sorts of reasons why we do that from time to time. I'll, I'll be the first to admit, I sometimes like blank out when somebody's talking to me. Um, you guys ever do that? Like somebody's telling you a story and then like all of a sudden, like they, they stop their story. You're like, Oh no, I, I missed it. Uh, I was hoping I was going to be able to pick up back up at somewhere before the end and it ended and I have no idea where we're at on this journey. And uh, I've done that from time to time. I, but one of my things I'll do, if that does happen, I'll be like, hey, I'll just come out and say, I'll be like, hey, I totally zoned out for a second. Something distracted me. My mind is somewhere else. Can you please like go back a little bit? Uh, like just rewind and, and hit play. And, and so I'll, I'll do that from, from time to time. But uh, because when you do that, people notice you guys ever, you guys ever been having a conversation with somebody and you can just see, you can see the lights go out. You know what I'm talking about? You're like, yeah, they, they're gone. <laughs> they're gone. And, and, and you feel it one way or the other. But when somebody, somebody says, hey, my bad, can we start over? You feel like, hey, this person really cares, really wants to hear. See, the reason why we do this is because sometimes um, we're, when we're focused on ourselves, we, we like to talk more than we like to listen. Uh, sometimes we're not good at asking asking questions that or showing genuine curiosity. Uh, sometimes we fail to consider other people's perspectives, or sometimes we try to take the spotlight and then put it right on us. 
This is like any any time that that uh, somebody does like a, a one upper story. You guys know what I'm talking about. Anybody here like self admittedly a one upper? Anybody? No, just a couple of you guys. I will admit I struggle with being a one upper. All right, like 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 one upping other people's stories, and, and uh, because and whenever somebody's talking to you and they're telling their their story, and you're like, oh, that reminds me of this one time that. And you're thinking in your head, the way that we justify it is we're like, oh man, like if I share my story that's similar to theirs, but mine's slightly better, then we'll like really bond because we had a similar experience. It's mine's slightly better. But what we don't realize is as soon as we do that, that person's like, I really did not feel hurt. I felt like you're just waiting to like interrupt me to tell me your story. And the thing is, is, is I always have that going on in my head. Like somebody's telling my story, I might always think like, hey, this is how I relate to that. We, we all do that. It's natural. And so if we've had a conversation, you've been telling me a story and I didn't try, I didn't like one up it, just know that that's how much I love you. Like I, that was a conscious effort to not try to overshadow your story, but to make you feel heard because we as people, we can all fall into that uh, from time to time. See, because, but the thing is, is the way that we listen to others is what makes them feel heard. It's what makes them feel cared for. And it's what makes, what makes them feel loved. In fact, as we jump into um, our scripture today, we're going to jump into Acts chapter 16. And in Acts chapter 16, we, we, we run into two guys named Paul and Silas. Now, now Paul and Silas, these are, these are like a, a tag team missionary uh, uh, team that, that's, that goes out and that, that they're, they're taking the gospel everywhere. They're taking it to all these, these regions that Jesus hasn't really been preached uh, yet before. And, and they're, they're taking it and they're seeing lives change all over these communities. They go to this one particular community, and, and while they're there in this town, uh, there's this, this lady who starts following them around. Now, now the thing with this lady, is, two things, is um, she was, she was demon-possessed, all right? And, uh, and what that particular demon did was it gave her the, the ability to predict certain things from the future or, or claim certain things from the future. Um, and so she was almost like a, like a psychic. Um, but the other thing about her is she was actually, she was actually a slave. She, she was owned by another, another couple, right? And, and this couple who owned her, the way that they made money off of her was by people would come give, give her money as a psychic to like predict something from their future and then they would pocket the money, all right? And, and so, so here she is, she's living in captivity in two ways, uh, captivity um, through slavery for this couple that she's working for and captivity to this demon that's literally possessing her. And, and so here she is, she's, uh, she's going around uh, and she's, she's saying all these things about, about Paul and Silas. And eventually they've just like had it. They're so annoyed with her that they just like turn and they just cast this demon right out of her. Now, as they cast this demon out of her, not only did they cast the demon out of her, they cast out her psychic capabilities as well, because that's what was given it to her. And, and so they cast all of this out and she's excited. She's happy. She's finally set free from the torture and torment from this demon. But her slave owners, the ones that were holding her against her will, the ones that um, the ones that were making a profit off of her torment, they had big problems with this because because now their 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 cash opportunity is gone. So they get everybody in this this town in an uproar that these people are coming in. Now they're ruining their business. Now they're now they're hurting their pocket. So they ended up they end up accusing these guys. That they attack them, and then they have them beaten and thrown in prison. All right, so, so they're beat, these, Paul and Silas, they're beaten, they're thrown in prison. And that's where we pick up in our, in, in our story in Acts uh, 16, 25. And it says this, it says, here they are in jail. All right, remember, they were just beaten. These guys are bl all bloodied and they're a mess. Now they're sitting there shackled together and shackled to the walls. And this is what it says. It says, about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. All right, here they are in prison, just got the life beat out of them. And they are praying and, and holding a worship concert right in the middle of it. It says, and the other prisoners were listening to them. That everybody's like, what's wrong with these dudes? Like, like here they are. They get thrown in prison for, for following Jesus. They get beaten for it. And they're going to pray and sing right now and worship. Like, these guys are crazy. It says, suddenly, as, as they're praying and, and worshiping, there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And at once, all the doors flew open and everyone's chains came loose. The jailer woke up, and when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to take his own life um, because he thought the prisoners escaped. Now, the reason why this is a big deal uh, and why he's about to take his life, because in, in Roman society, if you were a Roman guard all right, of a prison, if 
the prisoners that were there escaped on your watch, then you got whatever punishment that was coming their way. So in this jail, there's people that are going to be beaten. There's people that are that are going to um, be tortured in all these different ways. There, there's people that are going to get um, get crucified. They're going to be murdered and, and all this stuff. And, and this Roman guard is like, there ain't no way I'm going through all of that. And so he's about ready to end it because he thinks these guys escaped and he's about ready to get all of their punishments. But instead, Paul shouts, he says, don't, he says, don't harm yourself. We are all here. All right, the jailer, all right. You know, probably super confused. It's like, what? Like, are these guys, are these guys idiots? Like, it says the jailer called for the lights and rushed and fell um, trembling before Paul and Silas. So he's amazed that these guys had a perfect opportunity to escape, but they didn't. They chose to stay. And he says this, he says, sirs, what must I do to be saved? See, this, this, this guy who was set there to, um, who's pro who's there to guard them to make sure nobody gets out. He's probably one of the one or possibly one of the ones who helped beat these guys in the process that he is now amazed that when these guys had an a clear clearly god created an opportunity to flee they chose to stay to show him love to show him grace and to show him mercy and so immediately his heart his his hardened his hardened heart that that was literally beating these guys earlier is now asking them what do i need to do to be like you what do i need to do to have what you have that makes you so different than the rest of the world. And so they reply, says, they say, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. So then they spoke, uh, spoke uh, the word of the Lord to him and um, to all those in his house. And at that hour of night, the jailer took them, washed their wounds. So he's bandaged them up, takes them to the household and they were baptized. So all this happens because these guys chose to show love and grace and mercy when they had a chance to flee. When they had a chance to look out for their best interest, they put his interests first. See, this, this story has everything. It has, has demon possession, fortune telling, exorcism, angry mobs, beatings, imprisonments, um, uh, uh, dungeon, shackles, chains, earthquakes, freedom, celebration, all these different things happening. But there's two things that really stand out to me uh, from the story, and, the, the, uh, and that's uh, Paul and Silas's humility and their boldness. Their humility and their boldness. See, let's start with humility for a second. See, some people think humility is is thinking thinking like less of yourself, like like I'm not I'm not that great, I'm nothing, I, I'm I'm worthless, or 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 not being able to take a compliment. That's not what humility is. See, humility is about not drawing unnecessary attention to yourself and drawing attention to others and God instead. See, and we see Paul and Silas choosing humility in in this circumstance in, in several different ways. See, in jail. All right, Paul and Silas, they could have been selfish when they were thrown in jail. They could have tried to run. They could have tried to fight. They, they, could, have, um, they could have been angry. Um, they could have been angry with God. They could have been angry at the people and just cursing everybody and all that stuff. But they didn't. They're like, oh, off to jail. Oh, all right, so off to jail as they're getting beaten on the way. But they don't. And, and instead, what well, they do, they, they worship there. And, and so in worship, instead of focusing on their unfortunate situation, instead of being angry at God, like, God, we're following you. How could you let this happen? They chose to pray to him and worship. Like, all right, God, if you have us in here, then there's got to be a reason for it. So I trust you. Show me what it is. All right. And then, uh, and then with their mercy, they were humble with their mercy. See, Paul and Child, or Paul and Silas, they were they were speaking whether they were speaking to huge crowds or to one jailer, they spoke with the same love and grace and intentionality. It didn't matter if it was thousands of people or one person. They loved them the same. They they weren't prideful. Like, hey, no, I don't. I only share the gospel with thousands of people. Like, like I'm kind of a big deal. I'm a disciple of Jesus. Like, no, they're, they're, they're not like that. It's any opportunity God, God gives me, I'm in. And then not only that, with their message. See, whether, Paul, uh, whether, they were, um, whether they're looking out or speaking to one or, or many, um, they were always just all in. They were all, always ready to share the gospel. And they humbly pointed people to Jesus, not themselves. They didn't sit there in this in this jail cell when they could have ran and like, yeah, we're just like really great guys. We're just better than a lot of people. No, they never patted themselves on the back once. They they always took that opportunity to point to God. See, they could have focused on themselves. They could have focused on their own needs, but they didn't. They chose to keep their eyes focused on God. All right. And second, Paul and Silas, they spoke with boldness. They, they were unashamed. Uh, they, they, they spoke with boldness and clarity because they knew why they were there. See, all the different disciples, they all had different personality types. You had your, your outspoken ones. You had your shy ones, all this stuff. 
But when it came to, to giving the message of Jesus, they were all, all in. They all spoke with boldness and clarity because they knew that it wasn't them speaking, but it was God speaking through them. See, in, in Mark chapter 13, before Jesus is about to be crucified, he's talking to the disciples, and he says this to him. He says, he says, whenever you are arrested and brought to, brought to trial, all right, so, so keep in mind, Jesus is talking to the disciples. He's like, you he's basically saying, you will be arrested for this. He's saying, whenever you get arrested, all right, that's, that's kind of like, hey, it's going to happen, but don't worry. He says, whenever you're, you're arrested and brought to trial, do not worry beforehand about what to say. Just say whatever is given to you at that time, for it's not you speaking, but the Holy Spirit. What Jesus is telling them is in that moment, when, whenever you're given an opportunity to speak about me, realize that it's not you speaking, it's me speaking through you. It, it's not you talking, it's, it's, it's the Son of God speaking through you to whoever it is that's there. It's, it's like I'm speaking on your, on your behalf. It's like I'm already there. And he's telling them not, not to worry because he's waiting, he's looking for those moments, and he's ready to use them. See, Paul didn't make this message all about himself. Uh, many people heard that the message of Paul, but when they did, they didn't believe in Paul. They're not like, oh, Paul's the best. They believed in Jesus, and that's what his me message was all about. See, and their boldness came from being unashamed of the good news, being unashamed of who God was, who Jesus was, what he did, and what he came to do. And that was to save a lot of broken messes like you and I. You see, you can try to, um, you can try to pass on the good news while being arrogant or, or self-assured um, self or, or self-conceited. Um, but that's not what Paul did. That's not what Silas did. They, they always humbly pointed people to Jesus rather than themselves. You see, but it, because people, if you really want people to hear you, and you really want them to hear what you have to say, especially when it comes to Jesus, then we have to learn to pass on the good news with humility and boldness. What that means is, is being humble enough to say, hey, I'm not perfect. Like, like my, my life is not always easy. I am in need of God's grace just as much as anybody else. But I'm not afraid to say it either because but after all that God's done, how can I keep it to myself? How, how can I hold this all in when, when God, with all that God has given me? You see, the thing is, is when we speak with, with humility and boldness, especially when we speak with boldness, what we're doing is we're recognizing who God is and we're, we're just letting them out of the cage. If, if you imagine, if you imagine the Holy Spirit of God like this, like, like, like a lion, all right, the, the scripture says, scripture says that, that Jesus is, calls him the lion of Judah. All right. When, when you get this picture of the book of Revelation of Jesus in heaven, you see him as both a lion and a lamb, both, both humble and, and meek, but bold and courageous. And so when you realize that Jesus is literally a lion, just, just waiting to be unleashed out of the cage, then we have to ask ourselves, how can I keep him in? How can I try to hold him down and say, oh, but I'm just so ashamed. I'm, I'm, just, I'm just so worried what people will say. Jesus is like, just let me out and watch what I do. Just watch what I do when you go out, when you go to your school, when you go to your team, when you go to your family. And when you speak me into the situation, watch what I can do. We're about ready to, to sing a song here in a second. It's called Gratitude. Uh, from Brandon Lake. Uh, maybe some of you have heard it. Um, but what this song sings about is, is this humble approach, is this humble approach to God and, and to saying, saying, hey God, like I'm bringing all that I can to you. I'm humble in the sense that, that I understand God, that there's nothing that I can bring that is fully worthy of all that you are. But I'm also going to be bold in the fact that no matter how shy I am, no matter how worried I am, I'm just going to let it all out, God, because it's everything that you deserve, that you've placed this inside of me. You've placed you, your Holy Spirit, inside of me. It's time for me to let you out. And so as we're getting ready to pray or and sing, um, I want to ask you this question and really think about this. All right, and that, that is, if you were to let God out of the cage in your life, if you let God out of the cage in your life, how do you think your life and the lives of those around you might look different as a result. Really think about that. If God is, is a roaring lion living inside of you, just waiting to be unleashed, waiting for you to, be, to take him everywhere you go, how might your life and the lives of those around you be different if you just let him out? So let me go and pray, um, and we'll, um, we'll stand up and we can come to the front and say, God, I pray that you move in our hearts 
God, I pray that, that you will live and abide in each and every uh, inside each and every one of us. And I pray that you will move like a fierce roaring lion through our communities, through our schools, God, um, just leading a, a transformation everywhere we go. God, that, that the world in ourselves, our lives, our situations would be different because because we are taking you, we're laying you out and we're taking you where we go. We are allowing you to make the difference that you want to make. We're, we're no longer digging our heels in, in the sand. We're, we're, we're no longer planting our feet, but we are moving because God, you are ready to move us. So God, we pray that you'll let it, we'll let you do that. Uh, it's your name we pray. Amen.